Hey guys, welcome back. So in my last video, I gave an overview of the two main archetypes of traditional womanhood. And in today's video, we'll explore the two main archetypes for men. First, it's necessary to consider the difference between men and women. I stated in my last video that women work towards heroism by serving someone outside herself, traditionally either her husband or her son. Some modern women may find this idea offensive because we're so conditioned to believe that our highest purpose in life is to serve ourselves. I explained in my last video why that belief of self-service is ultimately harmful to women, and it's also harmful to men, but not in the same way. There may be a tendency to assume that because a woman serves the other, it must be the opposite for man, and his role is therefore to serve himself. What else would he serve if not another? But it's true that men don't aim to serve an other, but neither do they act in service to them, or neither should they act in service to themselves, I should say. Traditional man, absolute man, serves an ideal, a principle. And in serving these principles, he comes to embody them and can thus provide a life-affirming vision for a woman to serve in him. If his essence or vision is insufficient, then his woman will find the service of him to be unsatisfying. However, if the principle he represents is embodied in a vital way, this will act as a grounding and magnetic force for her. This is even more apparent when uh, compared to the modern man who so lacks visionary gravitas that those few who still represent this idea in an integral way as a result have near infinite attraction to women. When the true king appears, all are compelled to serve him. The two types of heroism for a man that Julius Evola speaks about are the archetypes of the warrior and the ascetic. Both the warrior and the ascetic are different paths of serving an ideal. The ascetic is the path of contemplation. He is the thinker, the visionary, the guru, the philosopher, uh, even the artist. Traditionally, the ascetic would renounce the world or part of the world in some way in pursuit of living for a philosophy or expression of earthly perfection of the mind and soul. The warrior, on the other hand, is the path of action. He takes the idea and manifests it in the world. We might traditionally think of the warrior as someone brutal who gets his way through force, but the warrior can have many expressions. You could, for example, fight on the battlefield of ideas rather than as a physical warrior in the military. Basically anything that involves the path of action to manifest an idea in the world. All of the greatest figures in history are an expression of a warrior or an ascetic. Unfortunately, the warrior caste was almost completely destroyed in Europe by the European Civil War of 1914 to 1945. And the ascetic caste was severely depleted initially due to the poor decision of the Catholic Church not to allow priests to marry and have families. And finally, when the job was finished by the communists, whose first task in any country they took over was to wipe out the intelligentsia. Many of the modern intellectuals who would have previously belonged to the ascetic caste have been subverted and used to hasten our dispossession. If you look at the attacks on manhood, it's always a two-pronged attack on these two archetypes of traditional masculinity. It's always either the warrior or the ascetic being attacked. No one attacks the merchant or laborer castes. Now, the warrior and the ascetic are interdependent on each other because neither of them alone can achieve the manifestation of the idea in the world. The warrior lives out the idea, but the ascetic creates it. One cannot enact a vision that hasn't been created, and there's little purpose in creating a vision that cannot be enacted and defended. So for this reason, modern men should aim to cultivate ele elements of both archetypes within themselves so that they're able to adopt or create a vision and be the agent of its realization in their own personal lives. In other words, the role that society used to fulfill in providing a compass and direction through culture is now placed upon the individual man. And although you may personally feel more drawn to one than the other, often the nature of, time, of the times will call upon a man to choose a path that he's not naturally inclined towards, and so the man must rise to the challenge. However, as much as it's impossible for us to rediscover the principles of modern science in one lifetime, so too is it highly unlikely that an individual will overcome the natural state of ignorance that comes with being young and lacking experience to arrive at a clear understanding of our own nature and our place in the greater scheme of things. 
For this reason, it's said that we stand on the shoulders of giants that have come before us who have left us with archetypal illustrations of innate nature so we can navigate the forces within us and integrate them into a state of being. The man who has the idea can't do anything with it unless he can get men of action around him to adopt the idea and incorporate it into their ethos. The warrior without an idea to follow is only a mercenary, a hired gun. A good example of a, of a blend between the two archetypes is the samurai warrior who is equally skilled in both contemplation and action. He has learned to control his mind and his body in equal measure. Uh, this concept of self-mastery is integral to both archetypes and is really at the core of this concept of traditional masculinity. Whether you master your mind or your body or both, the same virtues of self-discipline, responsibility, uh, commitment to the ideal, and steady, unwavering effort are required. Sometimes you need to embark upon a path sufficiently to see whether or not it's your best way. The reason this is essential on man's path is that in order to serve an idea rather than yourself, you need to master yourself to the point that you can, to some extent, overcome the desire of your ego that you should serve it. Ego desires are always at the center of someone acting in service to themselves. So this is important for both men and women who want to escape the clutches of modernity. Self-mastery allows you to see the difference between serving your ego and serving a higher principle. And when you've attained a high level of self-mastery, it's much harder to lie to yourself, to convince yourself that the subtle ways in which you act and service your own ego is really some higher principle. Many people fool themselves into thinking that they're acting with the right motivations because they haven't achieved the level of self-mastery to properly reflect on their own motives, which requires a patient analysis of the subconscious. It's not something we readily develop in order to see the role that their own egos are playing in dictating their agenda. Um, so why is all this relevant or important today? Even though, like modern women, most modern men are so far fallen away from the archetype of absolute man to the point that it's almost impossible to see it manifested in them, even in a small way. The male nature is still solar. This means it's distinguished by being the source of one's own light. And men are still naturally attached to the realm of ideas. And this is where they draw their inspiration and purpose from fundamentally. This is why men are so much more susceptible to nihilism because when they don't have a higher principle to believe in, they feel lost. Women are less susceptible to it, at least on the surface, because women without men to serve who embody principles for them and being of the earth and therefore bound to materiality and regeneration have the backup plan of creating a narcissistic cult around themselves in which they worship their own physical bodies and seek out broken men as devotees to their cult of conceit. Men don't naturally have a similar fallback, although it can lead to increasing homosexuality and transsexuality as men subconsciously seek to avoid facing their nihilism by using the same tactics as a woman, as on some level they perceive the power of the awakened divine feminine unrestrained by the male principle. This is explained in Hinduism by the interplay of Shiva and Shakti, but I won't go into, into detail about that here. Just suffice it to say that Shakti, the divine feminine, is pure, unrestrained power, possessing volatile energy, but without any direction. Shiva, the divine male principle, provides the intellectual grounding, the visionary guidance and action in the world. He's like a lightning rod for uh, the power of Shakti. Other men simply end up staring into the abyss, and it leads them to hedonism and escapism. So video games, porn, drugs, etc., this is why some people so strongly demand that their culture provide them with guidance because without the cultural signals and shared ethos, many people feel lost and that even when they are virtuous, they feel their virtue is not recognized or valued by their community. And in some cases, they're even scorned. This naturally produces nihilism in many who have failed to find for themselves their own guiding light. And you can see my series on nationalism and nihilism for a further discussion about that. Um, Another thing modern men do when they have failed to cultivate their own virtue and embody their principles is they look to others to do it for them. They look for a king, a prophet, a messiah of some kind. These men become followers of whoever it is they can look up to and they often hold their leader to impossible standards. 
They can easily become demoralized and disillusioned when their chosen leader falters. Uh, for many men, this could be an athlete, a rock star, a politician, uh, really any authority that they look up to. A good example of this is how upset people became when Trump didn't turn out to live up to his god emperor status that the meme lords conferred onto him. This is also a feminine lunar way of seeking principles because they're looking for it in an other, in something external. And they will try to tear apart anyone who dares to put on the crown of the king because they have invested too much in this other person to orient them in life. Um, even for the leader, it's often part of the same pathology of adopting feminine traits as uh, they may seek the ring of power in order to build up a cult of personality for others to worship at rather than genuinely leading for the good of their people. And the reason that this is still feminine is because instead of the pure motivation of wanting to serve an ideal as the true leader is often humble and reluctant in his role, but knows that the idea calls him to its service, they instead have a focus on personal aggrandizement rather than trying to fully embody a principle for the sake of the principle itself. Holding power always corrupts the person who is holding it. And the more powerful the man already is, the more holding a powerful position is likely to corrupt him. The temptation of the ego to seize upon circumstances for its own personal desires is very strong. So to take the analogy of the Ring of Power back to its source, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, we have Aragorn the warrior and Gandalf the ascetic. Both men were humble enough to know that the ring would wield too much power through them and they both refused to touch it. They had the wisdom and the humility to respect the corrupting influence of power and knew to stay away from it. But look instead to their less developed counterparts, Boromir and Saruman. Both believed themselves to be strong enough to withstand the influence of the ring and believe they could harness it for good, but it ultimately corrupted them both. In the backstory to Boromir, uh, a, a warrior, we learn that his tenuous relationship with the masculine role model in his life, his father, uh, who I call Denethor the Black Pilled, uh, you can ask me about that in the comments if you want to know why, uh, this relationship that he had with his father may have contributed to his desire of proving himself as an individual in order to earn his father's love, which overtook any good intentions he may have had in serving that principle he had sworn himself to. Now Saruman, is, as the ascetic counterpoint, he was a more advanced wizard in his grasp of magic than Gandalf, which may have led to hubris, and he became fascinated and excited by power for power's sake. Uh, he was rather Faustian in this way, and he was willing to compromise his moral integrity for the sake of the knowledge of the all-seeing eye. This is also lunar because he's not finding in himself the embodiment of any principle, but is instead looking to Sauron's power, which is external. He effectively worships Sauron's power and wants to take it for himself rather than developing his own. His hubris and fascination with knowledge for knowledge's sake caused his fall. A man who embodies his own principles, who is the principle unto himself, is not bothered by what others do, and neither does he put unnecessary faith and hope into anything or anyone external to themselves. The key for men is to ask, not what woman he can serve, or how he can serve his family or nation, but rather, what principles do I live by? Does my compass point north? Is my vision just and true? And if you can answer yes to that, then the next question is, how do I represent the most perfect expression of this ideal that I can manage to be in this modern age? Remembering, of course, that the pure archetype is just what we aim for. You don't need to be the perfect expression of it in order for it to orient you and set you on the right path. You need not ascend the mountain in order to assemble with your comrades around the base. A man aiming towards heroism must become the principle that self-satisfies, whether as a warrior, ascetic, or a combination of the two. He must live his principles as the living word, the logos. This is what men are seeking. Looking for somebody or something else to embody that is the feminine lunar way. And we say lunar because uh, the moon reflects the light rather than generating it, uh, rather than generating any light itself. And men are meant to be the solar sex. In this dark age of the Kali Yuga, there can be no false supports. Self-sufficiency in this regard is a key component of traditional masculinity. 
It is also, as I stated in a previous video, the only way to fix many of our modern crises, especially the gender crisis. Women find their principle in the man, but the catch is for that to work. The men have to be a principle unto themselves before they can be a principle for her or for anybody else. This is at the root of why modern people are so lost. Both men and women need a principle to serve or they become decadent and degenerate without the stabilizing masculine force to ground the chaotic, mutable feminine. Woman revels in her material existence and descends into narcissism. And this is why I have said in that previous video that regardless of who is at fault for the modern gender crisis, it, also, it ultimately falls upon men to save us all. And to do this, men must embody virtue and become that self-satisfying principle in order to ground women again. The wild horse will not don its own bridle. You, you can't request to Shakti that she put her power away, but she will be immediately drawn to the lightning rod that is the masculine expression of a principle. There is no new idea that's going to save our people. We don't need any rehashed ideologies dressed up with fancy new labels. What we need is to build a new man. And too many in our movement are inadvertently stuck in a degraded form of the path of contemplation, engaging in intellectual masturbation to serve their own egos at the expense of cultivating real virtue in themselves. And others are inadvertently stuck on a degraded form of the path of action, looking to destroy civilization without any vision to build from a new delving into revenge fantasies and doomsday cults. Neither of these energies are being channeled appropriately. Nietzsche said, in times of peace, the militant man attacks himself. The new man should orient his compass towards a healthy archetype of absolute man and seek to cultivate virtue in himself. It is seen as fundamentally masculine to be able to assert your will through force. But the secret to masculinity is when your capacity for force is so overwhelming, but your mastery of self is so advanced that the simple expression of your will is sufficient to make everyone want to comply. The truly masculine man does not need fits of anger or violence to demand his way. Instead, the strength of his presence, the essence of his aura, the metaphysical nature of his being is such that all who behold him feel compelled to follow in his way. A man's principles must become internal to himself. The whole purpose of virtue and ethics is to have a code to live by that both expresses the soul's true nature and helps the man connect with that nature. Living by these principles changes your metaphysical makeup and your personal gravitas, your aura, so to speak. Man's greatest challenge is not to dominate anyone or anything external, but to master himself. This is the greatest battle a man can fight. Within you, you will find the adversary most perfectly suited for you. And this sounds challenging, but so are all paths worth walking. But I believe in my brothers. And if you have watched this through to the end, then perhaps you feel something in you calling for more. Perhaps you have what it takes to break free of modernity and become who you were meant to be. And ultimately, isn't this why we fight? Not to preserve the broken and dysfunctional modern degenerates, but to honor what we used to be and resurrect that ideal in the future of what we can be again. And I believe that when enough men rise to the challenge and conquer themselves, then they will conquer the world and restore order based on a positive vision of the next golden age. Thanks for watching.